Hello, and welcome back to the Prentice Hall Biology Textbook. Today we'll be covering Chapter 16, Evolution of Populations. Okay, 16-1, Genes and Variation. So, Genes and Variation. Darwin never knew how heredity worked. And this was because Mendel's work with heredity was not recognized until the 1930s. Okay, how common is genetic variation? So genes have at least two forms, or called alleles, and organisms are heterozygous for many genes, which means they have one of one type of allele and another type. Okay, variation and gene pools. So, a gene pool consists of all genes, including all the different alleles that are present in a population. And because members of a population interbreed, they share a common group of genes. The relative frequency of an allele is the number of times that the allele occurs in a gene pool, compared with the number of times other alleles for the same gene occur, and this is expressed as a percentage. So gene pools are important to evolutionary theory, because evolution involves changes in populations over time. In genetic terms, evolution is a change in the fre relative frequency of alleles in a population. Now we have sources of genetic variation. So the two main sources are mutations and gene shuffling. So mutation. A mutation is a change in a sequence of DNA, and these can occur because of mistakes made in the replication of DNA, or as a result of radiation, a result of radiation or chemical radiation. So now mutations don't always affect the phenotype. The codons can still code for the same protein, even if an, a letter has been changed. And so some mutations can affect an organism's fitness. Okay. Now gene shuffling. So. Chromosomes of a homologous pair move independently during meiosis. This means when they split up, they can go to either to any of the, uh, the gametes produced. So as a result, the 23 pairs of chromosomes found in humans can produce 8.4 million different co combinations of our genes. And then another process of gene shuffling, crossing over, also occurs during meiosis. And crossing over further increases the number of different genotypes that can appear in offspring. So sexual reproduction can produce many different phenotypes, but it doesn't change the relative frequency of alleles in the population. There will still be the same number of uh, alleles for each gene in the population. Okay, next we have single gene and polygenic traits. So single gene and polygenic traits. So heritable variation can be expressed in a variety of ways. The number of phenoty phenotypes produced for a given trait depends on how many genes control the trait. A single gene trait is controlled by one gene with two alleles. However, many traits are polygenic traits, and they're, which means they're controlled by two or more genes. So each gene of a polygenic trait often has two or more alleles, and as a result, one polygenic trait can have as many possible genotypes and phenotypes. Okay, so the graph over here, this polygenic graph. So the graph shows the distribution of phenotypes, in this case height, that would be expected for a trait if many genes contributed to the trait. So we see that the highest number of individuals are in the middle, in the uh, their average height, while there's a few individuals who are taller and a few individuals that are shorter. So this is called a bell curve, as we can see it's shaped like a bell. Okay, 16-2, evolution as genetic change. So natural selection never acts directly on genes. It affects the entire organism, not a single gene, and that, enti that organism either survives and reproduces or dies without reproducing. So natural selection on single gene traits. Natural selec selections on single gene traits can lead to changes in allele frequency and thus to evolution. If the mutation is beneficial, the new organisms will survive and reproduce. If the mutation is detrimental, the new organisms will die. Okay, natural selection on polygenic traits. So. Natural selection can affect the distribution of phenotypes in uh, three different ways. Directional selection, stabilizing selection, and disruptive selection. So directional uh, selection is when an individual at one end of the curve has higher fitness than those in the middle or at the end. And when this occurs, directional selection takes place. So we see this here. This is the uh, first this is the first phenotype curve, so it's a straight bell curve. And then when directional selection happens, we see the curve shift over because individuals here are better at surviving, so they become the more frequent frequent uh, organisms. 
Next, we have stabilizing selection. So stabilizing selection is when individuals at the center of the bell curve have higher fitness than those near the ends. And what this does, as we can see from here, is it will narrow the overall graph. So even more, uh, the highest frequency is right in the middle, more than the traditional bell curve. Next, we have disruptive selection. So this is when individuals have higher fitness at the ends. And this splits the curve in two, which we can see from the result. The average phenotype drops down while the two uh, phenotypes on the end are higher. Okay, genetic drift. So genetic drift is a random change in allele frequency. In small populations, individuals that could carry a particular allele may leave more descendants than other individuals, just by chance. Over time, a series of chance occurrences of this type can cause an allele to become common in a population. So this may occur when a group of individuals carry a, alleles in a different relative frequency and they colonize a new habitat. So if you have a group of organisms with different allele frequencies, if they move out of the main population, they form a uh, smaller population that has, has um, all the different allele frequencies. So the, a situation in which allele frequencies change as a result of migration of a small subgroup of a population is known as the founder effect. Okay, next we have evolution versus genetic equilibrium. So under evolution versus genetic equilibrium, we have the Hardy-Weinberg principle. And the Hardy-Weinberg principle states that all allele frequencies will remain constant unless there is one or more factors affecting the population. So genetic equilibrium is the situation when allele frequencies remain constant. So the Hardy-Weinberg principle needs, uh, must meet five conditions to be satisfied. So there must be random mating, and random mating guarantees that all organisms have an equal opportunity to produce offspring. The second one, the population must be very large. This, uh, a larger population, has less effect from genetic drift. Okay, the third one, there can be no movement into or out of the population. So this means that no new alleles can come from new individuals, or alleles cannot leave the population. Next, mutations. Because most of almost all of genetic variation is a result from mutation, if there are no mutations, there can be no new alleles. And the last one, no natural selection. So natural selection means that if there's no natural selection, all genotypes must have the same chance of survival and reproduction. Okay, 16-3, the process of speciation. So speciation is changes that lead to the formation of a new species. So for speciation to happen, there's a few things. One of them is isolating mechanisms. So for a species to evolve into, an, into two new species, the gene pools of the two populations must become separated for them to become new species. And then as new species evolve, populations become reproductively isolated from each other. So reproductive isolation is when two members of two, when members of two populations cannot interbreed and produce fertile offspring. So first we have behavioral isolation. So it's a type of an so this is a isolating mechanic, and it occurs when two populations are capable of interbreeding but have differences in courtship rituals. So they breed at different times of the year, is an example. Next, we have geographical geographic isolation. So this is when two populations are separated by geographical barriers, such as mountains, rivers, or bodies of water. Next, we have temporal isolation. So this is when species reproduce at different times of the year. It's very similar to behavioral. Uh, isolation. Okay, testing natural selection in nature. So Darwin's hypothesis relied on two testable assumptions. So let's talk about his finches. In order for beak size and shape, to, beak size and shape to evolve, there must be enough her heritable variation in those traits to provide raw material for natural selection. I.e., they must be different from each other. And then the differences in beak size and shape must produce differences in fitness that cause natural selection to occur. So the different beaks must give some finches uh, an advantage over different ones. Okay, variation. So variation, the great variation in the heritable traits among the Galapagos finches led to them becoming different species. Okay, and then the natural selection of it. So the birds with the different sized beaks had different chances of survival. Um, during a drought, when there were only larger seeds, the birds with the largest beaks could eat the uh, harder to crack seeds and then would survive. Okay, speciation in Darwin's finches. So speciation in the Galapagos finches occurred by founding of a new population. Geographical isolation, changes in the new population's gene pool, reproductive isolation, and ecological competition. So first, the founders arrive. 
Now the founders were the few finches that landed on the islands from South America. We can see here it's almost a thousand kilometers to the Galapagos Islands. Next, geographic isolation. So the species flew to different islands all around the Galapagos Islands. Next we have changes in the gene pool. So the populations on each island became adapted to their local uh, environments. Next we have reproductive isolation. So different beak sizes bird and birds because of the different beak sizes, birds with different sized beaks would not breed with uh, each other one. They, they tended to breed with similar sized beaks. Next we have ecological competition. So more sp uh, specialized birds have higher fitness. And then continued evolution. So the original founders, the original finches, produced over 13 different species of finch. Okay, studying evolution since Darwin. Limitations of research. So we have not, in our lifetime, we have not seen the formation of new species simply because uh, it hasn't been a long enough time. And that's, okay, let's go to key concepts. So key concepts. In genetic terms, what indicates the, that evolution is occurring in a population? Okay, what two processes can lead to inherited variation in populations? How does the range of phenotypes differ between single gene traits and polygenic traits? Describe how natural selection can affect traits controlled by single genes. Describe three patterns of natural selection on polygenic traits. Which one leads to two distinct phenotypes? How does genetic drift lead to a change in a population's gene pool? How is reproductive isolation related to the formation of new species? And what types of isolating mechanism and what type of isolating mechanism was important in the formation of the Galapagos finch species? Alright, that's it for chapter 16.